to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it is always a pleasure to have you with us here on the program as we dive into all kinds of different subjects uh, that have to do with New Paradigms for a New World as we give you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. Today's program focuses on an area that has been a part of my life and probably yours since I was a little kid, my parents, uh, I had the very distinct pleasure of interviewing my parents uh, several years ago. The interview is not available yet because my mother told me, and by the way, they are both still alive and doing well. I may not make it public, but I have shared it with the family. They've shared the link and so forth. Uh, but one day, uh, I'm sure that uh, everyone will be able to hear it. But what we talked about had to do with music and the importance of music in our family. And we're going to talk about that as well here on the program with uh, an extraordinary musician and author. He's uh, taken uh, from uh, tickling the ivories uh, to tickling the keyboard, possibly, unless, of course, he does it in longhand. Who knows? Everybody has their own process. Become the Instrument is the title of the book, and it is Lessons on Self-Mastery from Music to life. Ken Werner's my guest. Ken, thank you so much for being with us here on the program. Thanks uh, for having me, Richard. Your main instrument is the piano, as it is uh, depicted yes. here on the cover of the uh, book. All my life. I took piano lessons um, when I was a kid, as probably most kids did. I still remember my piano teacher's name, Mrs. Granary. And I would go over to her house. It wasn't far from my parents' house. And she taught me the one song that I really worked hard to get was the, the and I guess it's typical in, in music lessons, is Ode to Joy. You know, da 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 sure. Oh, my gosh. Um, and there was one lesson she taught me, and I, maybe we can start here. Uh, if I made a mistake while playing that or any other song, I was not to go back to the beginning. I was to pick it up and just keep on going because if, if I didn't, I'd never learn the rest of the song. You're talking about practicing or performing it on some you know, I, minute level? Practicing it so that if I got to, a yeah. point to perform it, then I would know the whole, I would know the whole song. That's exactly right. And, and that's a lesson. If you always start from the beginning, the strongest part is the first eight bars. And then it's downhill from there. So <laughs> if you, you're lucky you got that really good information because if you, if you start from there, not only start from there, but make that the new beginning of the piece or say two bars before it into it, then you'll make that part of it as strong as the beginning because your association with the beginning is that it was the beginning. So the given was that you always start from the beginning. If that spot where you break down became the beginning, that would be a new beginning mm -hmm. as far as practicing. Obviously, when you play the piece, you just keep going anyway. You don't start over. But when you're practicing, you take the missing of notes as really good information. Yeah. And it, it makes me think of uh, the thought just came to me as you were sharing that. Uh, life might be like a roller coaster. Well, once you get in the seat, you get strapped in and you're on your way. There is no going back if you made a mistake. You got to keep, you, I mean, it just keeps moving forward or a train or an airplane, you know, uh, it just keeps moving forward and you've got to learn how to uh, make those adjustments, I would think. Well, I mean, that's one of the lessons from music to life. I um, knew uh, well, I mean, I knew it pretty instinctively in music because for some reason I had naturally the healthiest possible uh, attitude towards music because I knew it really didn't matter as much as everybody acted like it did. And that may sound almost like heresy, but the <laughs> fact, but it's, but that's the way I viewed it. And just from that, I skipped a whole bunch of problems that people create when they look in the mirror, which is to say when they're playing music, which is like looking in the mirror, right? But what I learned, the pain I caused, you know, in my book, a sub theme is the ways I didn't have this together in my life, but I effortlessly knew it in music. So it took me a long time to realize that a mistake was 
to be, you know, effortless mastery doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. It means that you have instant forgiveness. Mm. So, you know, now I realize the purpose of a mistake is to practice instant forgiveness of myself. And I'm not even talking about music because I can't find a mistake in music. Right. But I can still think of myself as making mistakes in life. And what I used to do is everything I would tell everybody not to do in music. Don't beat yourself up. Don't, you know, it doesn't change your value. I tell musicians, see, this is what I mean about music, not as, you know, the, the, the aura or the, uh, the, 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 you know, the sort of image is how important it is. But I tell my students, I would never let my value as a human being be uh, determined by something as insignificant as how I play a musical instrument. You know, that is that is quite profound. I myself uh, took a photography class of black and white uh, film photography in college, took a semester of it and uh, did not do that well because I was processing, for example, when I was in the dark room processing the uh, negatives uh, in the enlarger on photo paper, I wasn't getting the contrast the way that the instructor wanted. I was getting it the way I wanted. And I think that's something that, that we have a difficult time learning. Now, I- Let me I just ask you something about that. Sure. Did you get the, what did you call it? Was the, uh, was it the- Yeah. The what? The contrast between- you black the contrast and... the way you wanted it because you could not get the contrast the way he wanted it? Correct. Or were you already, rebe okay. So see, there's a big difference. If you're an early, artist that means that even against the the wisdom of just going to school you already have an idea if you say to me i didn't get it the way you said it you made it sound like a virtue <laughs> you made it sound like i not only I, I didn't get the contrast the way he wanted it but i got it the way i wanted it and that's why i asked you this question because if the point was that you couldn't do the technology to get it the way he wanted then you were asserting art in there when you time to learn yeah right? yeah I, but yeah. you were saying i could do what he's saying in my sleep i just choose to do this well that's like the other side of the moon yeah and i think that's really what it was was that i was doing it um i, I was just doing it period i, I wasn't there wasn't any rebellion in it for kind of like me i was always very strong in inventing something yeah. but not very not so great in learning someone else's invention yeah. now do, do you write music Oh yeah, I've written a lot of music. Okay, I oh, I I am a single songwriter. I've only written one song. It took me three months, uh, and I worked with a, a good friend of mine here in Santa Barbara to to write it, and um, I have a, an enormous, a greater appreciation for songwriters now, uh, and what they go through, with the struggles, the challenges, and so forth. But one of the things that I have found so fascinating is the songs that are really popular, that really resonate with the public, are those songs that, as the phrase goes, come from the heart, that they're not manufactured. I know that uh, when I was uh, learning about music in the 70s, when I was in my teens, still in high school, and then in, in, in my 20s and the 80s, I learned that there was within the music industry this formula of for making a hit, all right? Well, that formula has nothing to do with coming from the heart. Now, it would be popular for a while until the next formula song came along. But in this day and age, there's one artist and I kind of I get chided a little bit for bringing her up, uh, but she's not the only one. And I'm also listening more and more to country music these days. I actually worked back in the 80s for a country station, fell in love with the genre. And um, it's Adele who writes from her life experiences, from her heart, from her pain, her sorrow, her fears, all of the, and her joy too. Um, and I know that even with instrumental music, it's the same way. I, there's a flautist by the name of Tim Weisberg I, I just absolutely I love listening to his music. Um, I know him. Yeah. John Paul, uh, oh, is it? Um, uh, what is his name? Uh, uh, oh, I can't remember this. The, the, another flautist, classical flautist. Um, I probably wouldn't know him. Oh, I think it is something like that. 
Um, uh, even the music of Vangelis, for example, which is more Who? etheric and electronic. Who's Vangelis? Vangelis, he's uh, he's more of a uh, an electronic instrumental uh, uh, okay. creator. And then there are people like a, a Stephen Halpern, who in the 70s and 80s was creating, and is still alive, I've had him on the program before, who create is creating music for meditation. And I know you talk about meditation in your book as well. Um, it, it, there are so many different ways for us to express ourselves musically. Do you find that the people uh, that are, let's say, first introduced to performing or, or playing an instrument? I mean, if it's a piano or uh, let's say I learned to play the piano, the violin, the accordion, uh, the recorder, uh, the baritone was the last thing I learned how to play. I hope you were able to achieve the contrast. Uh, I was able to achieve the contrast, right. but I don't. I don't play them anymore. I just right, right. Play the vocal cords now. So I just, let me try. To, you know what you're saying is massive and actually evolving into other things before the end of it. So, which part would you like to focus on? Well, people that play got, from the heart, write from the heart. People that write, uh, uh, you know, formulaic. Let, uh, let's talk about from the heart. How do you get let's there? You know, what are we driving at? Yeah, let's talk about From the Heart uh, uh, as we continue talking with uh, Kenny Werner. His book is entitled Becoming the Instrument, Lessons on Self-Mastery from Music to Life here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and let's talk a little bit here, Ken uh, Werner, about uh, the, the music that comes from the heart, whether you are writing it, as you have written, as well as performed as as you have also done playing from the heart as well as writing from the heart okay the first thing is the most uh that comes to mind the most uh the most the biggest block to playing or writing from the heart is trying to play or write from the heart mm. when you try to play from the heart or write from the heart you can't locate the heart the heart happens to you. You don't access it. Now, there are some people that are blessed with a direct connection. And to write a note is to begin to express the heart. My other thoughts on this is that you don't know who's formulaic and who's not. And just who's more skilled than somebody else. There's nobody that writes a tune that doesn't want to make you think it's from the heart. Even if it's a commercial for aluminum foil. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, but the actual ability to connect with the heart is a practice that doesn't even involve music. So when you mentioned meditation, I'm not a great meditator, so I don't call myself a representative of the meditation, uh, you know, place, you know, right. revolution. I have learned the simplest way to get into what I call the space. From the space, there's simply no expectations including whether or not I get into my heart or not, which paradoxically often ends up becoming something I start to feel because I haven't gotten ahead of this thing, which by the way, the Hindi, Hindi idea of this is Shakti. Yes. You know, Shakti is the goddess energy. Yes. And the whole, you know, so <clears throat> in order to, it's a paradox, but in order to, feel Shakti entering my process. And it may not be a musical process. It could be, you know, showing my wife good vibes, or it could be walking our new puppy we just got, you know. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, um, if I surrender, that's the paradox, I may start to feel something support me, which you could call connecting with my heart or connecting with the Shakti, uh, definitely whenever you've been in that place, what doesn't occupy the same space is expectations. Mm. Nobody that ever felt expectations simultaneously fell into their heart, mm. which is why in the amateur, it tends to happen when you're not expecting it. Mm -hmm. However, there is such a thing as a professional writer. And what, ha what a professional writer can do is learn the technology of the form and then they can even lay out, you know, you come out, I, I, I've talked to composers and authors, and I say, what's the most anxious moment you experience? 
and and they don't really get it right. I say, no, it's the empty page. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Now ask yourself, why is an empty page anxiety uh, inducing? Because you want to write something good. So then I tell them, half joking and three quarters not joking, write something bad. You'll fill page after page. <laughs> and once a person can do that, they may notice some other thing joining them. In fact, very often what stops a person is that they try to write badly and it gets good so fast that they are now attached. Yeah. So what I teach is at that moment, trick your ego. Don't get caught back into trying to write a great piece like the first four bars. Put the pen down or put the computer to sleep and walk away. Mm -hmm. So you start to isolate those moments of pure inspiration. And if you lose them through ego, and that's what makes you lose them, pure inspiration can happen at any time. All you have to do is sanction whatever it is you're going to do. You know, but as long as we have a standard or a validation of that this we do and this, this is quality and this is not quality, we, then the moments of true inspiration are truly rare. Yeah. So as you drop everything, you have the best chance of connecting. And that's for somebody that's never done it. For the professional, they know they can go as far as laying out the form. They can even lay out as sort of a story, but the words aren't even close to what they want to say. Then they might walk away. And they come back, oh, of course, what I was really talking about in this first verse was this. Because they have something to work off of. And then they, as they live with it, they might go, I might even say this like that because I can feel that more. But the form, the, the fact that they're, the reason they're professional is because they can lay almost everything out and then invite the heart to refill the, the, the container. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because the, the uh, there's a quote I heard uh, uh, from the comedian violinist Jack Benny, and this has to do more with performing, and he turned it into something good, but he says... I'll take anything Jack Benny has to say. He said, well, he said, you have to practice even to be bad. And he, he, he would play, I, I'm sure that he was still an accomplished violinist, but he I don't know. We never had any evidence of that, actually, because <laughs> even when he finished the tune, the, the tune was a little suspicious. The yeah. tone was a little thin. And I'm sure he'd be the first one to tell you that. And I disagree with his statement. Okay. You don't have to play at all to play badly. Well, that was his joke, I guess. That was his... That's the great, that is so Jack Benny yeah. that I will treasure that. Yeah, absolutely. Kenny Werner is my guest. He's got a book out and it's entitled Becoming the Instrument. It makes me think of um, another quote um, uh, of, a, uh, and, and someone's probably said it. I don't remember who said it. It wasn't me. I just repeat it. Uh, and it is, uh, stop trying to control the process and become part of the process, which leads me, just which leads me, Lao Tzu, to a question regarding this whole issue of writing as well as performing or practicing whatever, just playing your instrument, whatever it may be, even your voice, the singing. Uh, and that has to do with improv, improvisation. Now, there are certain jazz musicians, for example, that I have some albums of, I think it's... Um, I think it's Grover Washington, but I can't recall off the top of my head. I know last name is Washington, and it's all over the place. <clears throat> I mean, I can't believe that uh, this particular album, anything is written down on sheet music, you know? Uh, but there oh, Okay, well, let, me just, let me just clarify that. Sure. In jazz, it's one page of music. That's the tune they played at the beginning, which might happen twice. Mm -hmm. And then the way they came back to at the end, you will notice was the same so that was the song something that was anywhere from 24 bars to 32 bars long right mm -hmm. everything you heard in between was intelligent improvisation okay now and intelligent but first of all let me just make a statement about improvisation it works this way if you're willing to improvise you can be doing it today the only thing that blocks improvisation is the same thing about the first page of a book or a composition you want to improvise well if yeah. you get rid of that yoke around your neck, it's just a choice of one thing after another. It doesn't even have to be music. It could be movement. And what I'm doing with my hand, I'm not doing anything with my 
hand. I'm simply not restricting it from anything it wants to do. Right. By definition, I am improvising. Mm -hmm. And the good news about that is that anyone can do it. I'm, the book is about taking the lessons out of music where tend to feel people feel it's kind of proprietary. You have to be a musician. No, what I'm doing is extracting those lessons and showing someone they can do that cleaning the toilet. You know, it's a yeah. state of mind. So improvisation is the willing movement. I heard there's a great guitar player, Jim Hall, whether you knew, knew his name or not, but and that was Grover Washington, yeah. But um, Jim Hall said it's the courage to move from note to note. And I love Jim Hall. He was like, a, a, you know, the father of a whole modern way of guitar playing. And yet I can't totally agree with that. If you don't give music undue, undue, uh, you know, uh, importance, then it doesn't take courage at all to move from one note to another. Hmm. Because if you stop and think about it objectively, there's absolutely no consequence except for the possibility that you'll feel foolish, which is, by the way, one of the five fears in Buddhism. It's amazing because fear of death, fear of this, fear of being fool, feeling or being foolish. Mm. That's amazing what a strong power that is. Without that fear, improvisation happens like it is happening right now. This word is following that word. Everybody's always improvising. Exactly. And jazz, when I say it's intelligent improvisation, because it's got a set of chords. Now, so does a Grateful Dead tune, but there might be two of them chords. You know, that's a great joke once. Uh, the difference between a rock guitar player and a jazz guitar player. A jazz guitar play, oh, a jazz guitar player plays a thousand, you know, a million chords and makes it a dollar. A rock player plays one chord and makes a million dollars. <laughs> so, you know, jazz is because it just developed. Nobody made it that way. It was just the evolution of the next people wanting to pick it up from where the last people were and see if they can't find something a little interesting, right? It's gotten to be a highly sophisticated thing for good and for bad, you know, for, for, for whatever, that's what it is. So a chord progression in jazz is like the difference between, uh, you know, nuclear fission and, uh, you know, uh, you know, and pouring a glass of water. Yeah. I mean, it's that it's very sophisticated. So intelligent improvisation, like let's say you had a saxophone and you just start wiggling your fingers and blowing. That's improvisation. The jazz guy has the same sensation, but simultaneously he's on those chords. Each one of those chords take, like if you're playing rock or country, even if it's got four chords or five chords, you can pretty much hunker down with one scale when you take your solo, because it goes what they call diatonically over those other chords. But in jazz, you here, well, you know what? I can give you a little uh, unexpected thing for the for the podcast. Absolutely. Here's my, here's my little upright here. So if I'm playing, if I'm playing rock, you know. Yeah. was an extra chord or two it was the same scale all the way on yeah if it was jazz it might be this i've already had more scales in those first four bars than in the entire career of the guy that was playing the other two. Oh wow <laughs> wow <laughs> all right so watch That goes. And it's what I would call not just intelligent design, extremely intelligent design. Yeah. Extremely intelligent. I always like to make a little parallels there. Uh, extremely intelligent improvisation. And that takes as long as it takes to have it and shouldn't even be thought about for anybody that isn't positively starving for yeah. it. Yeah. It's the most unvaluable thing in the world it's like trying to be a door-to-door -door typewriter salesman now you know what i'm saying yeah. so it's an art and a craft that is of no importance to anybody except the few people that like that sound and yet it's a human achievement 
it's like amazing. So, and I'm not saying it's totally unpopular, but yeah. compared to the least popular pop star, it's like a fingernail, you know? Or, yeah. So uh, it's really quite fascinating, you know, you directing us in that direction because, you know, uh, I would say everybody, in fact, the lesson from music to life is I would have anybody improvising, say on a piano or a drum, because you don't need to know anything to play a piano. Right. Right. No, not like a saxophone, just to get the E flat major scale, you have to know what keys to press. So put someone on a piano and for their mind, have them go into what I call the space and mm -hmm. receive. E I know they can do it. You push one button, then you push another, then you push another. And if they drop their context completely, I believe it'll open up a whole other thing in the mind that will show up in their non musical life. Wow. That's very cool. Uh, there's another area I want to go into, but I want to let our listeners know you're listening to Tell Me Your Story. Uh, we're talking with uh, Kenny Werner. His book is entitled uh, Becoming the Instrument. We're talking about lessons on self-mastery from music to life. He's also the author of Effortless Mastery. Maybe we'll touch upon that in just a couple of minutes as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host and I have to tell you, this is, <laughs> I am just uh, utterly uh, enthralled with the direction that we're going here and, and what you have brought to the table here. Uh, we lay out what, what I like to call a smorgasbord, a big old table, and we put those ideas out there on that table and we ask people to come and partake. You know, if it resonates with you, great. If it doesn't, don't. Stay away from it. But please keep coming back to the table. I want to ask you, uh, you know, I, uh, I know enough. Uh, I, I, as the as the old saying goes, I know enough about music to get myself in trouble. When I was writing my song um, with this gal here in Santa Barbara, um, she was shocked that I was actually able to write down. And she had this; uh, they had, she had the sheet music, you know, that was blank. It had the treble and bass clef and so forth. And I was actually able to put the notes right where I wanted and the type of notes, whether it was a, 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 a full note, half, quarter, eighth, and so forth and so on. Do you and, read music? I'm sorry? Do you read music on any level at all? I can, I can parse it out, but it takes time. From, the, from your childhood lessons, perhaps? I'm, from your childhood lessons? For, partly from my childhood lessons. I was oh, I just wondering because there's no way someone's going to accidentally write no, 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 no. This was really... And where they want to put it. So she was amazed at that. Wow, yeah, that's great. She was. Uh, but of course, I was also a singer in high school in the Madrigals. Uh, and then I joined a choir group here in Santa Barbara that also had its, um, it would break up into quartets. And when I became a member of this group and created a quartet with three other gentlemen, it was then, it was only then that I found out my father had been uh, a member of a quartet, which was really kind of extraordinary. By the way, the name of the quartet that I was a part of, I came up with the name because we couldn't really come up with the name. I said, we're going to call ourselves the quartet to be named later. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about um, the aspect of the different types of notes and rhythms between the traditional, and I'm going to say Western, eight octaves and eight notes, okay, versus the Indian ragas that are, I, I mean, uh, you know, okay. you know, you've got well, the better, and then you've got with the ragas, it's just, you know. Okay. It's uh, I got you. I got you. Yeah. Um, rhythmically, again, the Indian music, you know, the, the uh, virtuosic Indian, there's a simple Indian music too, a chant that never changes. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the top line stuff is on a rhythmic level that's unapproachable. That's almost like a, like a UFO. We don't know how far advanced they are from earthlings, you know, but I mean, <laughs> and yet they can't do things we can do, but we really notice that we can't do that. Yeah. Unless we really study it and then we can do a bit of it and if they're a little generous in spirit, we can do it with them. I've done it, you know. But the real serious thing of it, uh, there's, a, there's some Western musicians that achieve that. But we're just talking about the comparison. Right. Uh, the most, the most, well, I first have to make a statement about American music that, you know, the whole times and, and the times of uh, racial 
uh, institutional racism and how much this has come to the forefront. I have to say, I was thinking about one day, I said, you know what, if it wasn't for black people, this would country would have the saddest music in the world. I think I'd agree. Oh, and I'm, yeah, I'm not saying that because of what any white people have written. I'm saying, cause even what white, I mean, I think if it wasn't for black people, the music of America would be, she would be coming around the mountain when she comes. <laughs> and that's a cool tune. But I mean, every time we get to anything that seems so uniquely American, yeah. I'm so conscious of the African-American influence on it. That it's like, it's time we gave it up. I can't believe how humble they've been to not throw it in our faces. Yeah. Well, now I was watching the, 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 the national anthem performed by a few different people. I was showing my students. There's uh, from the heart mm -hmm. and then there's from the heart and mastery, meaning you are a master, right? So yeah. first I played, it wasn't Adele, it was uh, Demi Lovato. She did it a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I said, that was good, right? Yeah, she, you could see her getting ready to do it. And everything. if you sometime show your, your uh, viewers Demi Lovato do it. Then, of course, you might even know what I'm going to say. Put up Whitney Houston doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody can do the national anthem today. I mean, that's aware of the country. That's not just still singing it from, right. you know, yeah. UFW Hall or something. You know, nobody can do that tune today that's not aware of Whitney Houston doing it. Mm -hmm. And when you watch the two, they're both impressive. But Whitney is clearly on another level in terms of the ease. Yeah. For her to do the key she picked and Demi Lovato was cool with the same key but not as cool if I was her conductor I would have said let's bring this down one whole step because then I think there it'll be there'll be an element that won't even be involved right. which is when you have to do this or that you know but anyway it wasn't just that Whitney Houston was one of these unique presences on earth that unfortunately flamed out but it was more than just what a great singer she was God blessed her with maybe through her mother was an incredible vehicle or vessel, you know, like a John the Baptist and Jesus deal or John Joseph. And, you know, I, I have no idea if any of that exists, but I don't mind using it anytime, you know, but um, so her mother, who was very inspired singer or is, I'm not even sure, mm -hmm. oh, like, would have been this incredible vessel and then launched this once in a, once in a, in a not a generation in, in a lifetime. Mm -hmm talent and ability to connect with the heart so when you watch those two you see the pinnacle of what a human being can do you know when the once in a lifetime kind of talent plus this channeled ability to connect with their understanding of god whatever that is right, right? yeah and uh you won't see that too often you know so I don't remember what the question was, but that's what you made me think of. You went down the right road there. You definitely did. Kenny Werner's my guest and to Becoming the Instruments, the title of his book. Uh, website, where would where do we want to send folks who can find out more about you, the work you're doing, as well as get a copy? I'm sure that the book is available on Amazon and all the usual outlets. Yeah. Might even be available in your brick and mortar if you've still got one, folks. What's your website? Yeah, yeah it might. Um, KennyWerner.com. Oh, so easy. That's why so crazy. I thought to myself, I'm going to make it KennyWerner.com. It's so crazy. It just might work. It just might work. I would, <laughs> it was available. RichardDugan.com. It was crazy. Yeah, uh, and then you see everything that I, I'm doing, everything I'm about, a lot of my performing, and uh, the information on the book. And I do think we do sell the book on the yeah. yeah. Well, we're talking with Kenny Werner, and uh, we're going to continue that uh, that direction here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and uh, it is literally a pleasure to have Kenny Werner with us here on the program to talk about his work. I want to kind of go into another area that is, is related to what we were just talking about. Um, <clears throat> with very few exceptions, there is no piece of music that is created, written out of a vacuum. It is always influenced by what came before. And this is where I have a real, uh, and this is one of those real tough lessons, I think. This is where the whole issue of plagiarizing, if you will, will comes in. And it's like, if somebody were well, those to- those are two, 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 totally, two totally different things. Sure. Just to say that at this point, go on. 
All right. But let's <clears throat> just say uh, I happen to be a fan of three, three individuals who have since passed. John Denver, Harry Chapin, and Dan Fogelberg, along with Tim Weisberg as well, because they did a lot of collaboration together. And there are times when I can listen to any one of those songs from any one of those artists, and I'm hearing a little from somewhere else. I know I've heard that little riff there somewhere. However, there's never been a lawsuit. Nobody is suing them because they use this riff or that riff. And I, I find it fascinating that people don't seem to understand that nothing is created out of a vacuum. There's nothing new under the sun is also a biblical passage. There's nothing new under the sun. So all you're doing is you're taking bits and pieces from everything else that you've probably heard or been exposed to or been around. And maybe you're getting that input from on high as well. That's, that would be the exception to the rule in, in a manner of speaking. Um, that, that it's, you know, it's like, it's not, it, yes, you penned it, you played it. But in a real sense, it belongs to the ancestors before you who created and penned. Okay, that's, that's different than plagiarism. Okay, and we won't go to the plagiarism part because... Well, let me should I give you a few thoughts because, you know... Please, that's, again, I'm finished saying, with my comment. <clears throat> what you're me. saying expands while you're saying it. So, yeah. so let me try to... <clears throat> you're right, nothing's created in a vacuum and everything is built on the previous stuff. And if you are a studied musician, by definition, you studied the previous stuff. Yeah. You can't study the future stuff. And then schooling is actually the conscious plagiarizing of the familiar stuff as a means of uh, gaining uh, chops. Yeah. Knowing how to write a tune. You know, so that might be your assignment, write something just like that. So when you come out, the artist's progression may and they may not progress but it may start as something that's really familiar of something yeah and it may never change but you know there's a few notable ones that will really kind of i just thought of this while i'm still trying to answer your question if you look at ray charles uh what's her name the queen of soul um you oh. know uh respect uh aretha i want to say aretha, Fla aretha franklin. franklin aretha franklin uh who did i just say and uh, uh Ray Charles, Ray Charles. James, James, why am I spacing? Because I've been teaching all day. James Brown. James Brown. So if you check out their very first records, they're trying to make, I don't I'm not so sure about James Brown, but for sure they're trying to make Ray Charles, uh, uh, what's his name? You know, who sang chestnuts roasting on an open fire, you know, Nat King Cole mm -hmm. and Frank Sinatra. Those first records don't reflect Ray Charles at all, but that's what he came out of. He was doing it. He wasn't changing what he was doing. Yeah. And there, and same with Aretha Franklin, they were making her sound like I can't think. Uh, you know, I can't think of the woman's name, but she was actually friends with her, like a mentor, mm -hmm. and a great jazz singer. And you listen to her a number of her early records. They didn't really fire off big with the public, and they were nice, you know, uh, sort of uh, sophisticated you know, a female singer, male singer type stuff. In those people's cases, they were destined to innovate the music in that they would bring in a much older uh, 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 influence, mm -hmm. gospel music. Yeah. Okay, so they weren't coming off of the recent stuff of Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, Rosemary Clooney, and... Uh, you know, whoever, you know, uh, Sarah Vaughan or even, even, uh, um, God, I'm really spaced. This is a senior moment. Ella Fitzgerald, oh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. And then they started to say, I'm sorry, but even at the risk of total failure, I've got to go here because I can feel myself when I go here. And what that was really the birth of rock and roll which was the connection to gospel. If you listen to gospel music, you'll basically hear the first remnants of rock and roll yes and not only that but was rock and roll and soul or even uh tina turner same yeah. thing they all started trying to go down the uh the the main road as their producers were in you know encouraging them to do in those people's cases they had to get to something that touched them much deeper and at first really violent these producers were afraid because 
this sounds too black. You know, if you're not going <laughs> to sing what a difference, if you're not going to sing what a difference a day makes, and you're going to sing this deep blues in the South, this sounds too black. And they were worried about losing white audiences. And I don't know how it happened exactly, but it became the foundation of a whole new craze that, that Elvis Presley was only the copier of. Yeah, you want to yeah. talk about plagiarism? Yeah. Elvis Presley, and I think he would have admitted that. He was in Al Jolson got his shit from watching, you know, the Negro players in the, you know, in, in New Orleans and Kansas City. So, you know, this, but that's not plagiarism. That's respect, respect, unless it is plagiarism. Yeah. And then you have examples of white artists that admitted it and actually gave them the 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 cur the, the, the currency and the and the uh the royalty the, and the credit ro well the yeah the royalties and the uh, credit you know yeah. and then the ones that just kept moving on and claimed it for themselves yeah. so, you know so so everybody's going to sound like something it's very rare when someone comes along and they kind of sound unique and when they sound quote unquote unique it may be that they're building on something that people don't typically build on with that instrument. Mm, mm. For example, when Charlie Parker was playing, he played 50 notes for every one that Lester, you know, uh, Prez played, right? Especially, yeah. But he wasn't following saxophone players. He was following Art Tatum, ah. who was and may be still the reigning virtuoso that ever played the piano. So he played a million notes, perfect notes. So Charlie Parker doesn't sound like anybody before. I mean, there are times when he'll give you something and that will remind you of this or that. But essentially his whole language and Dizzy Gillespie comes out of something that doesn't come from the saxophone. Yeah. Nobody played like Dizzy Gillespie. I mean, Louis Armstrong certainly couldn't put notes in succession like Dizzy Gillespie. Where'd they get it from? They still got it from something, but it wasn't a traditional source. Yeah. So your question again opened up we could do a show on every one of your questions because they have all these different directions as they go in. You know? <laughs> Thus is the danger of the universe asking the questions. I'm just along for the ride. All right. That's effortless mastery. Yeah. yeah. Kenny Warner is my guest becoming the instrument and I choose to be the instrument. Uh, to um, to bring you these kinds of uh, programs and conversations uh, here on Tell Me Your Story. My name is Richard Dugan, and we are talking with the author of uh, an extraordinary book and a conversation that I am really, really enjoying here. I hope, I wish that it wouldn't come to an end, but it will eventually here. But we'll have you back because, as you say, there's so much that we can talk about. Lessons on self-mastery from music to life, and also the author of Effortless Mastery. The, the other thing I wanted to touch upon here when it comes to the comparison between the lessons from music to life, uh, this was something that, that was shared with me. I was probably in my 20s. I was in a van with a group of friends. I still remember the woman who... Uh, <laughs> Again, in my 20s, had the biggest crush on this woman. Uh, her name was Shari Burns, and um, we, were, uh, we were driving along, heading back into town, into Phoenix, from, uh, I think it was Tempe. We had just been to a, a, a metaphysical or spiritual church and had an interesting experience there. And I, I just started singing this song. It just kind of came up. I'm usually very shy when it comes to singing because... I guess uh, as a kid growing up, um, in spite of the fact that uh, my uh, 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 madrigals uh, uh, instructor, or conductor, what have you in high school, said I had a great tenor voice, um, I was still, you know, embarrassed because if I screwed up, it was going to bring ridicule upon me, that kind of thing. Well, so you thought. Yeah, that's what I thought. It, it, it didn't. But um, so I'm singing this song and I am really putting everything very, the words very close together. And Shari turns to me and she says, you, you, you need to you need to put bigger spaces in there, you know, because it's it's the spaces that make the music what it is. Otherwise, it's sort of a run-on tone uh, that, that, that just kind of waves along. 
Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. There are people well, that it's spaces. It's the spaces that make prose sound like music. Yeah. Uh, and and I thought that was so interesting that she she gave that to me. She shared that with me at that time. Another another I, thing, I would like for you to talk about this part of it. Uh, I am I am a, a a strong strong proponent of education, not necessarily formal. And of course, we hear all the time uh, different school districts. We got to cut the budget. We just don't have enough money for all these electives like uh, physical ed and music. You have proven, in my estimation, that if they got rid of the basics, math and reading and science and history and so forth and so on, you would learn most of those through the electives they want to cut. Because what you just described in terms of the history of music, what we talked about in terms of learning to write music, there's one other element too. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen, and I found this out really clearly. Do you like poetry? Oh, no, I don't like poetry. Do you listen to music? Yeah, I love music. Then you like poetry. Because most of the music you listen to, vocals and so forth, if you just read the words, you would be reading poetry. So that's just one area of literature that one would learn. Uh, so what are your thoughts in regards to, let's just say, uh, because then there's the other area of learning science. I am fascinated and would love to learn how the first person who created, let's just say, the baritone. How did they know to to make it with the materials that they did and in the shape and the curves and the this? My sister, my eldest sister, she plays the French horn. A woman who grew up with asthma plays the French horn. Uh, but nonetheless, the same thing there or the clarinet or your instrument, the piano. Who decided that this was uh, I used to joke about uh, uh, the carburetors of the old, you know, the earlier, the 50s and 60s and 70s cars as a guy who had way too much time on his hands because I've seen a carburetor and how complicated it is. I don't think we have those anymore. But right, well, let me let me just please share, share take, take it down from the longest run on sentence I think I've ever heard. <laughs> OK, so let's go back all the way to education, please. I was a D student, D minus student, and that was a drag and gave me a lot of problems and a lot of, you know, uh, lack of confidence in myself. On the other hand, it showed me uh, some of what you just said I would, I would endorse. I would not endorse getting rid of math and language, and, right? but I would endorse cutting it down so that kids don't develop this neurosis over trying to keep up which is only exaggerated in college. And then if you happen to have something you actually want to accomplish in college, you have to try to accomplish it in spite of all this stuff, you know? And I am, being a bad student, going to go with that. In other words, I'm not gonna say, well, don't go listen to me because I wasn't a valid Victorian. No, I'm saying, I'm gonna assume there were more kids like me than there were like the valid Victorian, but you never heard from them. They were the silent, uh, you know, angst, angst ridden majority. Yeah. And I see that in music schools. I see so many people here that can't even figure out what to study. Music schools alone have become way out of control. And one of my jobs here in the Effortless Mastery Institute, which is what they have me here for, they recognize that it's all gotten out of control. What are the things that would be uh, a holistic, I guess, but, you know, like, uh, you know, wellness, you know, it's become a big thing in colleges now. And it's great that it's become big, but they like acknowledge everything except the elephant in the room. You know, are they not well because of, you know, the racial, you know, situation? Are they not well because of trans, you know, uh, gender, you know, simp empathy? Yeah. Are they not because of George Floyd? Are they, are they because of abusive parents or people... No. What about they're so messed up because of going to college and how much they're trying to deal with and they think they're supposed to. Therefore, they're not crying out to anybody, you know. And so I'm saying I want to and, and at this school, they're really 
inviting me more and more to mess with the basic form. So in a symposium I want to have, I want to, they have to pay all the teachers because if you pay them, they'll come. Yeah. And I want to say, what happened if each one of you were to comb out your, your, uh, you know, uh, you know, what do you call it? What they put in the, uh, you know, first semester, your uh, uh, syllabus. Well, syllabus, but I mean, the other curriculum. word yeah. curriculum. Thank you. See what? Wow. I also drove up this morning at six in the morning. So hey. I noticed a, a noticeable absence of, of nouns. I understand yeah, the curriculum. What if each one of you combed out your curriculum, taking up dispassionately everything that doesn't really need to be known by them? or considered, right? Instead of the, the reigning philosophy is to add stuff because they think that if it's harder to get through their course, somehow that's value added. And I disagree, I think it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. I think the more you slam them with details, the less of a service you're doing them. So I, we can't change it institutionally because there's a little thing around called accreditation. And accreditation is like the gold star that your parents wanted to see on book one of the Little Fingers book when you finished, they, they didn't really care how good you played. They want to see a gold star. And today, parents still want to see a gold star. It is called a degree. Yeah. And in order to get a degree, you have to be accredited. And to be accredited is to pay much more attention to quantity of things in certain scheduling times. Mm. Quantity, then the quality. How, can I do something? And now you can get away with that in most subjects. But in music, unfortunately, you can hear it if a person's really not absorbing anything. And yeah. you also don't have time to go look it up because once they count it off, right, it's only going to come out what you know and what you don't know will be very obvious. And that shows university as potentially a dysfunctional model for actually learning music. Sometimes I'll, and they hired me to do this. No. Sometimes I'll joke with the kids. I said, you're actually playing better and you've achieved that while going to music school. Wow, I can't believe it. You know, I mean, I'm like, you know, and, we're, we're, we're shaking the tree for sure, because everybody could have something profound to say musically if they stay within the bounds of what they know, but they have to respect it. If you think what I'm doing, this is piddly stuff, it won't resonate at all. So I think the lesson before even the most essential, the most essential lesson is to honor every sound that comes out of you and then practice not letting it go further than that. Then you want to educate yourself about a certain language. You do that with total generosity too. There's nothing like studying something, but not being attached to whether you learn it or not. Oh, by the way, something you just said, I think is quite profound. A lot of people, they don't think they can learn another language. I learned DOS back in the uh, mid late nineties. I actually wrote a line across the screen and I was amazed because Wow, I wrote that, and two, I understand what it is I'm asking the computer to do. Well, if you can write music, if you can play it and so forth, you're learning another language. So every time you go into a new subject, you're actually learning another language. And it's uh, to me, that's, that's also another part of this whole process. We're talking right, but to do that, to do that, you have to let go of the incessant need to qualitatively judge yourself. Absolutely. Becoming the Instruments, the title of the book, KennyWerner.com. We're going to be linked to your website, Kenny, so that Great. people can find out more about you. Before we let you go, I want to uh, let you folks know that you're listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I want to ask you, Kenny, about um, a, a particular chapter, 16 Variations on Getting Out of the Way. And I think one of my favorites, it kind of is right up there. Uh, with my career that I have chosen, my vocation, as I like to call it. Three very simple words. No, folks, it's not I love you, but I do. It's be the listener. Be the listener. Talk to us about what that means. Well, that simultaneously means don't think. Because if you're thinking, you're not listening. So it comes under the same general heading of the goal of meditation or yoga, even though I have, I've, I've achieved it more by just connecting to a single sound of an instrument. But being the listener means you're not focusing on your ability to understand it. You're not even focusing on quantifying whether you like it or not, or contextualizing it to what you think it is. So there's a thing I'm talking about in both the effortless mastery and becoming the instrument. It's called the space.
Mm -hmm. From the space, you don't listen through filters. You just listen. In fact, from the space, you don't really listen because you don't have to listen. If it's played in the same room as you're in, you'll hear it. Yeah. <laughs> and that, in listening, I, you know, I would have even changed that now because I feel the word listening has now took, taken on what uh, taken on baggage. What humans do is they take the truth, which occasionally comes along, and they can handle it for I don't know five years. I have a total guessing before their own urge to recreate it or teach to somebody else has already limited it from what it was. So even the word, if I say the word meditation, more people will think, oh God, I can't do that. Then if I said the word, you know, haagen -Dazs, oh yeah, let's go for that. <laughs> meditation, meditation, oh yeah, let's go for that. You know, every word starts to accrue baggage and then we need a new word. And I believe listening even has baggage. You don't need to listen. If it's being played in the room you're in, you'll hear it. So, but even what my realization was at the time I wrote that was that listening means you're not listening. You know, the whole art, really, I mean, this is a good place to end. The whole art to life, and I've taken my whole life to learn it in, mu in life, but I've always had it in music, is learning to be here now. I hate to, Ram Das, I hate to say it, but he said it, be here now. In other words, you're in this moment and you're not thinking. Hmm. In the 20th century and even and 21st century and even the 20th century, anybody that can achieve being in this moment and not thinking, I think that's the new religion. Okay. I, as soon as you do that, you become a real authentic version of yourself, not the version you've been plotting inside. So if you're listening to music and you're trying to figure out if you like it or not, you're really not listening to it. Yeah. Would you say that uh, music is your life? You know, it always has been. I started playing at seven and I even started doing acting out stuff when I was four, you know, imitating opera singers. I definitely was an entertainer. When I got into jazz, I only was embarrassed about the entertainment thing for a few years. And I said, I don't care what language I'm speaking, I'm entertaining. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm speaking new age language and I'm writing a book, it's, I think there's a lot of humor in my book, you know? And, uh, uh, and it doesn't matter what you think, creativity means I think it's funny. Mm -hmm. That's all I need to know. So what's happened is my dual ability to play it from there and explain it. See, most players that really play great, what would they, they, they would have very little language in terms of words to describe it. And they would probably lead you somewhere that would be nowhere near the path, just whatever they were thinking that day. And then people that are really eloquent in how they express it, usually can't play. Mm. So I happen to have, and it's, I'm not going to take credit for it, just develop like the things that happened to you. I know you didn't work that hard. It came through, yeah. right? Because yeah. we're not from the workers. We're from the channels. You know, we're yeah. the channel. And we don't take responsibility for what we're channeling. Otherwise, we couldn't channel it. That's true. So I have this unique dual language I speak, words and music. And what was your question? It was basically about music being your life. Right. So because of this dual thing, let's call it multimedia, mm -hmm. uh, not just music is not my life. Music is the result. Mastering my mind is my life. Mm. And one of the results can be music. I'm more interested in the state of mind that I'm in that produces astounding music than I am in the actual music. If I want to say on another level, music is obviously my life because from seven on, I did it with so little ease. I mean, with so much ease that it was a gift. It was a gift and it was a curse, you know, because I didn't learn how to learn because this came so easily. Mm -hmm. So yeah, music is my life, but I don't care about it that much. <laughs> I you know if I can put those two sentences together, but I am fascinated by the freedom that can be generated between the ears, the mind, yeah. that gives depth to anything. You know, like, that's heavy because I played it. Yeah. But you could have played it. So yeah. music is my life, but life is my life. I'll, leave, I'll, I'll put it that way. I love it. I love it. We're talking with Kenny Werner, and this is Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and we are uh, just about ready to wrap things up here. Kenny, 
I, uh, first of all, I would love to have you back because I would like to also talk to you about effortless mastery. I think that's a fascinating conversation in and of itself. Uh, but I also have three final questions that I ask all of my guests, and I would love to have the opportunity here to ask you those three questions. But first, I want to thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, as we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. We are here Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m. 9 a.m. on Wednesday mornings is our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. And we stream those programs live on a richarddugan.com. There's a link there for you to listen. We also have podcasts at SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations. We're also on YouTube where you can watch these interviews, and I hope that you will subscribe to either or both a podcast or video cast, and also uh, participate in what we like to call Kenny the decade of perfect vision, where we encourage people to go within and st stop and be quiet and still and listen to that still small voice. And if you'd like to support the work that you're doing, if it resonates with you and uh, you'd like to help us to keep moving forward, we have a PayPal account for your security as well as ours. When you go there to send, they're going to ask you for the email. It's Richard at RichardDugan.com. Richard at RichardDugan.com. And with that, Kenny, what I like to say at this point in our program is now we move into the lightning round of questions uh, for uh, Tell Me Your Story, the game show. Uh, the first of the questions that I have for you that I ask all of my guests, uh, you may have answered uh, during the program, but uh, I like to ask them directly. Who is... Kenny Warner. A very flawed human being that has had a knack for learning and understanding those flaws and being able to turn it over to other people that they might not waste as many decades hmm. trying to solve it. What is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you are doing now? I want to be, you know, I, I'm, I'm, it's not easy to eschew the jazz world, which I've spent 50 years in. And I'm not, would not exactly do that, but I feel like this is a multimedia experience. Talk, play. In other words, I want to be in Carnegie Hall, but I will talk as much as I play. I, I've done this, and a pianist once uh, defined it and said, I've never seen that before. That was like Victor Borger meets Deepak Chopra meets Keith Jarrett. And, and in that sense, it's unique. So I guess I'd like to do that and continue to compose on a more orchestral and revealing level. And finally, what is your life's purpose? Well, um, making sure my wife feels loved. And making sure she knows she is loved. Um, and giving this stuff. When you get older, there's no way to ensure that you know you have any value. But I, I get off easy. I know I'm helping people. And then I walk away feeling the value that's very empirical. I can see my value. So, um, yeah. I mean, I once said to my wife, I wouldn't do all this teaching. She said, even if you were doing for... You, even if you were wealthy, you have to keep doing it because you do it in a unique way. So I want to give, I really get off when I see people experience the freedom. It's usually in music, but a lot of times people coming, I walked into my, uh, my meeting in the boardroom and I was like, brilliant. And I was in the space and whatever it is, it's coming through me. I didn't work that hard for it. It's certainly not erudition. I'm grateful for it. It does provide money for us. I'd like it to provide millions of dollars. I don't mind even saying that if it, if it gets to that. But, the, but what really gets me off is when it lightens people's burdens. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of my life, I felt just because I played great didn't mean I felt worthy because I didn't have to work as hard for it as other things. So I would say I've accrued, I've, I've gathered a real um, appreciation of, for myself. Well, Kenny, again, I thank you so much for giving us so much time here on the program, and I really would like to have you back to uh, continue this conversation. Sure, let's do it.
You bet. I'm Richard Dugan, and I thank you folks for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to lol.